Hello, everyone. This week, I'd like to talk about the return to work, which is a big topic in most of your companies, um, and both the psychology and the economics of coming back to work. So let's talk about the psychology first. Last week or the week before, I had a long conversation with Marty Seligman, who's a famous psychologist and often known as the father of the positive psychology movement. And what Marty told me about many things, but one of which was this big study they did at the Army on PTSD. And they studied the prevalence of PTSD with all sorts of tests. And they found that the response to crisis is a sort of a bell curve. And on the right side of the curve are individuals who thrive under stress. And they tend to become sort of superhuman and they deal with the adversary and they move ahead and lead others. On the far left side, of course, are people that are significantly damaged or hurt by, the, by a crisis, and they oftentimes have PTSD that can last for years. And in studying that data set and, and all of the psychology of those individuals, they discovered that there were a series of things that they learned about the people on the left that can turn them more into the people in the middle and perhaps the people on the right. The first is the severity of the, the situation. The worst uh, the worst situation, the worst bomb, or the closer the bomb was to them, the, the harder it was for them to recover. So in this particular case, if you have employees that have had family members that have died, they have become sick themselves, they've been in the hospital, they've maybe had a very severe case of the virus, or their children are sick, they are going to be significantly impacted. So you need to treat them specially. The second thing they've learned is that the people that survive in PTSD and thrive have a sense of joy. They find things to do that are fun. Now that may sound a little odd in the middle of a pandemic, but you know, you can have fun. You can listen to, you know, funny music or you can watch movies. Uh, you can listen to comedy. You can get a dog. You can play music. You can play games online. These are very important elements of responding to the crisis and bringing people back to a sense of normalcy as we return to work and some form of work experience. The third thing that Marty talks about a lot is the need for optimism. And you know, some people have both a sunny disposition and an optimistic outlook on life. Some people don't have an optimistic outlook on life. So how do we affect that? Well, I think what we can do as HR people and business leaders and team leaders is we can give employees a positive and optimistic view of where we are going. Now, optimism doesn't mean wearing rose-colored glasses. It doesn't mean pretending there isn't a crisis and there isn't a lot of danger, because there is. But um, we know we're going to come through this, and with the right level of protection and safety protocols and work redesign, we can keep people safe. And so uh, we, as particularly as HR people, have to create this optimistic view of the future that is both realistic based in reality and optimistic about where we're going to go, which I'm gonna talk a little bit more about uh, when I talk about the economy. And part of that is thinking about the response to the pandemic as both a recovery and return to work and a business transformation. Because as most of you are discovering and we're finding out from all the interviews you do, you're not going back to work in the same fashion. You're not delivering products and services the same way. You're not going to have the same offices or amount of office space or number of offices. Um, and those are going to be positive transformations for everyone. The second topic I want to talk about, it's relative to psychology, is trust. Now, I mentioned at the very beginning of the pandemic when I uh, produced the reset, the big reset, um, that trust was one of the big elements of the reset. And people will not come back to work. They won't go on your airplanes. They won't come to your stores. They won't buy you know, from your uh, salespeople if they don't trust that you as a company or you as an organization or you as a HR department are creating a trusted relationship with them. They have to trust that if the workplace is supposed to be safe, it is safe. And there's three things that go into building that sense of trust. The first is competence. And I talked about this in the prior video. If we aren't doing things correctly, people will not trust us. If the planes are late, 
If people don't put their masks on because they don't want to put them on and we don't force them to put them on, if the office is not cleaned every night, if the plexiglass is not put up between the, between the partitions, or whatever it is that we're doing to bring people out to work, we have to do it correctly. We have to mandate that it be done. We have to be extremely clear on the protocols and the process of, um, of escalating things that aren't being done. So we have to be very, very careful at this point in time that everything we say we're going to do, we do and we do it well. The second part of building trust is ethics. We have to behave in a fair and ethical way. Now, a lot of people have been through a lot of stress in the last three or four months. People have lost their jobs, they've been laid off, they've been furloughed, they've had pay cuts, they've lost their bonuses, their families have been sick, their children have been home from school. Uh, you know, everybody's been through a whole series of things. Um, now, as we recover and bring people back to work and we start paying people and giving them their jobs back, we have to be extremely careful that we are highly ethical and highly honest and transparent in that process. I think a great example of this is something I mentioned before. Microsoft put together a program for employees that have children at home, many of whom they're unable to go to school, and said you can take eight or 10 weeks sabbatical paid to take care of your kids. That to me is an example of, a, of an ethical response to this crisis that people will remember. And there's lots and lots of examples of that. By the way, you will be held accountable if any of the decisions you make now are done for business reasons and not on behalf of people. The third part of trust is listening. Now we've talked about listening a lot in HR and the whole employee experience craze that's been going on for years, but this is absolutely instrumental now. In the poll survey that we just published last week about the return to work, one of the most important issues that people brought up as the highest priority in their company is continuous daily communication. Communication with the CEO, open discussions online or on video, lots of panels where people are interviewed to talk about what's going on at home, opportunities to feedback what is not working in the workplace. Because let's face it, going back to work from a pandemic is not something most of us have ever done before. So we're inventing it in real time. And so this need to be continuously listening, continuously communicating from the CEO on down, including in within your own work group, is a critical part of building that sense of trust. So if you think back about these psychological issues, joy, a sense of goodwill, um, positive, optimistic outlook on the future, competence, ethics, and listening, those are critical parts of building the return to work. And by the way, there's lots of things going on. Everything from new elevator protocols to how we use the restrooms, what happens in the cafeteria, how the desks are arranged, plexiglass between different people in different work situations, um, cleanliness, PPE in the office, met, you know, pro processes for reporting, on and on and on. We are studying that to death and we'll be sharing that with all of you as we get more information. The final thing I want to leave you with is a little bit about the economy. You know, there's a lot of press coming out about the recession and we're going to have this massive downturn and, you know, the federal government's going to have to put all this money into the economy and we're going to have all this debt. Well, yes, there is a recession. There's no question about that. You know, upwards of 20% of the United States is either out of work or has been furloughed and may be out of work. But I think the bigger story that you should use as your guiding light for this, even though your demand for your products may have declined significantly, particularly if you're in uh, maybe the uh, retail or entertainment industry or the hospitality industry, is that actually what's going on is a massive business transformation. Every company I talk to, after they react to the crisis and figure out what they do in, in the short term is realizing they can rethink their work practices, their talent practices, their products, their services in a whole new low touch digital way. Companies in the healthcare industry are delivering telemedicine. Entertainment companies are delivering incredible volumes of new forms of media and, and entertainment. The learning and education industry is going online even more than it already has. 
uh, delivery companies are finding new ways to deliver packages and products in a safer manner. Um, every industry is going through a transformation. So my belief is that while we may not have a V-shaped recovery, and it may be several months or quarters before the overall economy looks like it's growing again, most of you are going through incredibly interesting transformations. Let me just give you one more story on this topic. Three of the world's largest companies, one in the media industry, one in the insurance industry, and one in the entertainment uh, industry, are going through massive digital transformations because of the crisis. These are companies that were already trying to figure out how to reorganize themselves in a more integrated way to push into more digital businesses. And they had, in all three cases, grown up with different business areas around the world that were operated independently. And in all three cases, the CEOs came to us through their heads of HR and said, we're going to take advantage of this opportunity now that everybody's home and everybody's thinking about taking a new job anyway to redesign our entire business and how we go to market. So my positive optimistic outlook is that while there will be a lot of dislocation and there may be some temporary pain for a lot of you, in the long run, this is an economic transformation and one that we needed. One that will create more sustainable companies, safer and more hygienic work practices, probably improve the environment, and hopefully will lead in the future to more long-term growth. I hope this gives you some things to think about as you plan your return to work strategy. We are crowdsourcing all sorts of information for this, so stay tuned and we'll share everything we learn as fast as we can. Thank you very much.